coming at you once again. It's the Integrateness Podcast with Jason and Jolene. Guess which one I am and guess which one she is. Yep, she's got her hand up. She's Jolene. <laughs> I'm Jason. Good morning, Jolene. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And I say good morning because we always tape these in the morning, not knowing when people will tune in. So I should also say good afternoon, good evening, and good night, like the Truman Show. Yeah. And I should probably also say happy Thursday. <laughs> and that'll really screw you guys all up because it's actually <laughs> Tuesday right now, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Or yeah, exactly. Right. So this is the beauty of, of recording and, and recording in advance. Because originally this week's episode was going to be kind of about a continuation of our introvert, extrovert conversation and sort of living in a world that maybe isn't, you're not suited for, or you don't believe is suited for you. But looking at the calendar, we realized this episode drops right before Remembrance Day. And Remembrance Day is, is a very, I mean, Jolene and I both have grandparents that, that served in the Second World War. Um, Jolene, you work with veterans, you know, and RCMP officers who've dealt with traumatic experiences. So this is a time of year. People always talk about Remembrance Day as like, you know, honor those who fought for us. But we got to remember that the, the price that was paid to fight that fight and the things that they went through. So we wanted to talk about that a bit this week, sharing our own personal relationships with people who have been in situations where they might have had to take a life or, or seen horrible, horrible things. Yeah. And some of the biggest things we want the rest of you to think about is you might be thinking like, this isn't relevant to me, but it is because it happens as close as your, your parents or grandparents. And when we're looking at intergenerational effects of experiences, these do impact us. You know, I'm able to go back in my life and look at where in on my, on my maternal side, where my grandfather fighting in the war and my grandmother being back running a farm, you know, with multiple kids, um, how that impacted, you know, my mom growing up as the youngest of all those kids, my grandpa was home by then. So she thought that was quite a privilege. And I said, no, you got a very adjusted version of him, a shell shocked version of him, an emotionally unavailable version of him, um, uh, probably a drinking version of him. Right. So that doesn't necessarily mean that him being present and not away at war was a protective factor either. Right. And then I look on my dad's side and both his mom and dad uh, were fought in the war. My grandma used to like weld the wings on the planes and stuff. I just love that story. I just think she's so fucking cool. So, um, but his birth dad died very young. So my dad had this like huge passion for all things World War. Like Sundays were black and white TV day in our house where World War shows would just play all day. And I think that was like his connection to his mom and dad and um, his roots and what felt like home and um, all those things to him. But by recognizing where the impact of those people raising our parents who then raised us, it's so relevant to us. So no, we might not actually have anybody overseas right now. We might though, we might still, I mean, this is still active in our world in different ways, right? Um, but I really encourage you to look at, oh my goodness, how did this impact my parents' life growing up and therefore impact mine? So we want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. It is relevant to you still. We are only one or two generations away from this. Well, exactly. And, and um, it's, in, it's interesting too, that we like, I have friends who have been in the military, you know, and I've known people who have served overseas. So I'm glad you brought that up. This is still going on. Like Remembrance Day is sort of about, seems very focused on the second world war, but there's been other wars since there's now veterans coming back from those other wars. The big difference um, back in the second world war, I know when my grandfather came back, they were treated as heroes right so the world loved them for what they had done but they didn't have the mental health and the impact that all that trauma would have on them wasn't acknowledged then so there's kind of like whereas now they're not treated soldiers aren't treated as heroes nobody likes the soldiers once the war is over but there is some there's at least now an acknowledgement that this has taken a toll on them psychologically which i i think that's a good step forward but you as you've said they don't get the support maybe that we think they get Oh my goodness. And I learned this on a firsthand basis. I'm continually reminded of this through um, the individuals I work with. There's one gentleman that I work with who um, is very, uh, he was very public on my social media page with his story. He really has been committed to his healing journey and has had a um, tormented inner world since returning from war years ago. And that torment came out in 
um, self-punishment. Why, why, why did I get to survive? Why did my brothers die? Why was I, um, you know, saved in, in certain ways? And I mean, survived very, um, serious, uh, physical incidents as well. Um, but again, where that comes out and where we limit ourselves from living the life that we could be living. So, um, self-depreciating things, uh, and that impact, you know, our relationships with our spouses and children and families and all these things that innately come down to this core belief of like, I'm not deserving of this stuff. I shouldn't have been the one to deserve all of this. And these go deep. And, you know, I really, um, came, it was beautiful because, uh, he did speak very openly at the, um, Remembrance Day ceremony last year. And it was this kind of off the cuff, random moment that he really kind of stood up in front of the crowd and, and got to share his voice. But there's a big part of, of healing and sharing that comes from his story that he really wants to extend that way. So I encourage people to go look at my social media page if they're interested in his story. But some of the biggest things that um, have come out of some of that work, I mean, when we look at what people are required to endure when they're in those situations, you are meant to override everything natural about you. So all of our first line responders and uh, like first responders and stuff, they are overriding their nervous system every crisis they show up to right and then there becomes almost and I'm going to use the term brainwashing because you have to be so understanding and committed to your purpose that you override things that morally you would not do outside of that role it becomes a total mind fuck you guys so that becomes the main software that one operates from. And it's really hard to just undo that. It's really hard to undo that, you know, and some of the most beautiful components of some of these people that look really rough on the outside are that they genuinely care for humankind. They genuinely care for the people of this country. They will put others before themselves. They will sacrifice everything for others, which is detrimental to our mental health when you've been listening to all of our episodes and what we're really trying to encourage people to do right so when we are on a journey of healing all this stuff there's so much of that mindset that commitment to a country and then when that country starts letting you down and then when that country starts making decisions you know for this one individual I remember him having a really hard hard time processing when all of the um, children's bodies were found at the residential school a, a couple of years ago here. He was like mortified that here he was fighting for a country and he's Métis that was killing his children. It was fucked to wrap your head around this sense of betrayal from a, something, a country, a system that you were so loyal to that you would give your life for that was taking lives of your people. Right. So we look at the layers of this stuff and I have had the privilege of like walking alongside and unraveling these layers as they come out and they're complicated. And I think a lot of people have no idea the level of interconnectedness in all of these traumas experiences where that rolls into other relationships in our life like really sit well that happened uh, big time after the vietnam war with the vietnam veterans coming back and they, they were like you know i remember the conversations coming up although i was young but then people would be talking about oh and the guys came you know soldiers came back to new york after the second world war there was parades and they were heroes and we come back and we're being spit on and being called baby killers you know it's just like and they felt that sense of betrayal um, because they did go because, well, a lot of them were just drafted and didn't have a choice, but there's those who did go because they felt that they, you know, they owed their country, like just everything you're talking about, right? There's, there's whole families in Canada and the States that are career soldiers. Mm -hmm. The son did it because the dad did it and the grandfather did it and his great grandfather did it and fought in Korea. You know what I mean? So for them, it's this institution that's a, a, really is a beautiful thing in its own way. That, that sense of loyalty and commitment is way more than I'll have for, for Canada or people in general. But it's just not appreciated. And it does, like you say, it has its darkness to it. It's it's bad, side, especially when they try to unlock the trauma that they've experienced and can't figure out why it's so hard. Yeah. And it's interesting when you look at, you know, the, what did you say? Family career? It's, it's, it's their career soldiers that, I mean, everyone in their family, every male has fought in a war, you know, and especially down in the States, all the way back to the civil war. Yeah, I have family down in Florida, and you can imagine what the <laughs> intensity of their political swing is down there. And it blows my mind how they will stay committed to patriotism, 
even though it contradicts the mere needs that their family have. So they will stay committed to a party, even though that party doesn't support what the needs of their own family members have, which is again, like mental health care for like, I believe my cousin was in the Marines or one of one area of the military down there. And like, was not getting like one of the political parties would have not been supporting mental health support and and finances and support for these um marines coming back right like it's so wild how committed they are to a system right rather than being able to kind of look outside of that and go wait a sec here like what are we fighting for um, it is interesting. So I, it's, it, I'm glad you brought up the the US Canada thing, because I do perceive them as different. Um, and my uh, experience with Canadian veterans is that they also view that patriotism a little different as well. I think that just shows the differences in the countries, which is a whole other topic, even in its own right. <laughs> you know, probably for a political show, not a not a not a show on mental health. Um, uh, next week. <laughs> um, so some of the things I mean, really like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, like that's the biggest things our uh, veterans are coming back with. Right. And, you know, one of the most uh, frustrating things is how our country is not supporting them. So for them to see me, veteran affairs would fund a lot of that stuff. And it blows my mind. Uh, it continues to because I believe RCMP is funded by our by veteran affairs as well. And they're horrible to deal with. They do not recognize um, so many different benefits. They won't pay all of them. Um, and they have cut off some of my clients just out of nowhere, written a letter and say, your your sessions are done. And we don't get a close off. We don't get to complete anything. It's wild. And, you know, like with this one gentleman that I work with, that was one thing he was super passionate about. He was like one of the forgotten soldiers. So when he came back from Germany, somehow, somewhere, he slipped through the veteran affairs coverage and he's never been covered by them. Never. So here he came back and he was, I believe, like in a rehab hospital for like nine months after a severe accident over there and came back with zero veteran affairs coverage. That's funding. crazy. It's wild. So when we think about, again, that sense of betrayal, here I was loyal. I was committed to putting my life on the line. I lost brothers. I lost I, I lost life and body in different ways, right? Um, came back with all of this trauma and then feels completely dropped by the system that sent him there, like not recognized. So now his identity as a soldier, not being recognized by veteran affairs, challenges everything. Who am I? If they don't recognize me, like what, what is this? Where do I fit? And then you layer that on top of other things and other um, just existence in life, right? I mentioned he was Métis and you can imagine being in between both of those races and, and like that brings a whole other issues of the in-between, right? So it's, it, you know, that that system I have always had big beef with uh, in terms of where they are not supporting our veterans when they come back. And um, there is, I mean, they're living in poverty and they are not given basic needs that, uh, you know, they fought for, they fought for all of that. They fought for the right of choice. They fought for all of the freedoms we have in this country. And actually, there were a lot of veterans that were pissed at Canada for mandating the vaccine. And some of the most powerful conversations I had were like, just so enlightening, because you can look at it from like an anti-vaxxer perspective, but that's not what it was. And it was really beautiful to see where these core beliefs really stay for them. So, you know, the fact that they fought for freedom of choice for all of the people in this country, and they watched this country take away freedom of choice. So they felt so just betrayed in terms of we fought for these rights and you have now just overridden them and like they said like we're not anti-vaccine you guys shot us up with like 16 different fucking things to go overseas we're not anti-vaccine we're anti take away choice that's what we fought for right so it's been really interesting to watch all of these things unfold and like again where that core belief system then um really sits uh with individuals and how they're trying to navigate uh the way that the world is shifting in different ways that's that's fascinating because that's a co component i never thought about in relation to the whole vaccine issue which is again a totally different issue and it's kind of a moot point now but wow <laughs> 
<laughs> I hadn't either. And again, you know, like my, my one guy I work with, like he can be a real dick. <laughs> and if he's listening to this, he'll laugh, right? Because he can. And and people might perceive that as like, oh, he's just being an asshole going on a rant. But when you look at the rationale behind that, I'm it's mind blowing. I hadn't put those things together either. But of course you would be infuriated, right? Oh, huge, huge. Because that, that was the big for most soldiers, it comes down to freedom. You're fighting for freedom, people's freedom. Someone's being oppressed. We're going to mm -hmm. go stop them from being oppressed. And then, yeah, the government, for whatever reason, you know, the, in their mind, it makes perfect sense, given that our healthcare system's the shits anyways, and people are getting really sick, that we're going to put this in place to, you know, to stem the tide of people getting sick and potentially dying and overloading the healthcare system. But it still doesn't matter. It's taking away a right and freedom that someone fought for. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's what I believe, but that makes perfect sense in my head now, yeah. looking back. And then, you know, other things like protecting women and children and then things that are happening within this world where women are being oppressed in ways that like are often worse than they even were 50 years ago, you know, after we fought the same battles we're trying to fight again, right? So a lot of those things is really interesting to kind of dive a little deeper. Um, yeah, when you see perspective and where they're coming from. So when you look at that from a point of view of like how you maintain relationships with people, how you, um, you know, are perceived by others, uh, because it's pretty extreme opinions, really, for many. Um, and I think like it really needed to be in order to allow oneself to do the things that needed to be done overseas and in different scenarios and stuff, right? Um, but, you know, it rolls into daily triggers, daily triggers of things, you know? Um, so the one gentleman that I work with, he was very open about talking about his flashbacks and things. So he would wake up in the middle of the night multiple times a week. Uh, and he'd done this for years. And it was just this perpetual cycle of nightmares and flashbacks. And, you know, to the point of like having to wake up, change sheets, um, you know, sit and have a bunch of cigarettes for a couple hours to calm down, that kind of stuff. And after we had started working together, I'll never forget when he, um, and I use EMDR treatment, uh, as well as some other modalities and stuff. But um, he had said, you know, in the last, I don't know, maybe it was like a six month period. He's like, I can count on one hand the amount of times that's happened now. Like, it's incredible how resilient, how adaptive these individuals have been. You know, you've talked about this with your, with your grandpa, right? Oh yeah. He, because he fought in the second world war. He landed on Juno beach, you know, and he fought his way into Germany um, as soldiers did back then. And I grew up hearing all of his stories, um, you know, and he didn't shy. He never just went into the graphic detail because you don't tell kids that you know, kind of thing. But he, what was amazing to me through it all is he never painted this horrible picture of it. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to go. He lied about his age to go, to go and fight. Uh, so he thought it was a worthwhile cause. And he was always very, like he, he had a good sense of humor. He chose a career in the end as a firefighter. So still helping people. I only saw three cracks in that, in the entire time that I was a kid. One of all things, we were watching Family Ties. Remember that old series with Michael J. Fox? And there's an episode where Michael J. Fox is one of his best friends dies. And he goes through survivor's guilt. There's the one, and it's a very powerful episode. You didn't see that kind of thing on television. There's no laugh track. It was a special hour long episode where at the end of it, he just started, Michael J. Fox's character just breaks down and starts just saying, why am I alive? Why am I alive? Why am I alive? My grandpa said out loud, you should be happy you're alive because you're still here. So that was the first, first crack. So I thought it was interesting, but that shows a perspective, right? You survived, he survived. So appreciate what you've got and keep going. Second one, me and my buddy Trav rode at the lake and my grandpa was there. And he decided he was going to take us on a war patrol with a toy gun. So we were given like nicknames like they were given in the war. We went out into the woods. We went on all these great adventures. And it felt like getting a slice because he was like the sergeant. And we went on this patrol and, you know, we had a lunch pack. So we'd take a, the smoke break, smoke them if you got them, is what they'd always say in the war. And it was a, it was amazing. As kids, we were probably 10. And it, to go on this adventure and get kind of a peek into this. And again, he did it like very G-rated. There was no violence. But we had like one scene where he had, anyways. It was like getting a little taste of what it was like to be a soldier in the war. And of course, being 10, you lo we loved it. Like we wanted to go back out right away, but he would not do it. He would not do it. And we asked, you know, like kids do 15,000 times. And the last time he just said an emphatic no, wow. which was another sign, right? Like that it was just very. And it's funny you're mentioning that because that's totally what my dad had when he would rewatch all these war shows. And it was that fascination with and connection with and it it is right. And I mean, it, it was these things like, I mean, we have medals up like they're defining like I think my grandma kicked ass the fact that that's what she did. Right. Like 
I think it's amazing. And I still like, I am like literally singing that Paint It Black song right now because Platoon was a movie my dad would continually watch. And like, I would watch it to connect with my dad. And actually when the military helicopters were here last summer with the fires and stuff, I ended up like, I was walking around the airport because I live out that way. And they let me in to check them out. And I just was like, this is so fucking cool, right? They're awesome. But, like, that's the thing. It's really cool until you're in it fighting for your life, right? It's so wild. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is so much pride and, um, and, and honor in those roles and what people were, you know, capable of doing what they sacrificed to do. And, you know, the types of character they built in those scenarios, like, I think these, these individuals are exceptional beings, you know, and they have navigated and had to endure things that none of us will ever imagine in a lifetime, right? And when you have to dig deep in, you know, whether it's personal endurance, whether it's breaking through fear, through pain, the amount of physical pain these individuals have been in and overcome and problem solve through and, you know, relying on others and protecting others, this whole sense of everything. I really think that makes exceptional individuals. And I imagine when you come back from having to live in that state and perform in that state and be in that state, this world that you come back to might be really fucked up and it might be really hard to just exist with people who have no fucking idea. And even this morning when you were like trying to figure out different things, you're like, why is life so hard? And I was like, (laughs) it's not fucking hard. (laughs) 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 Your grandpa would have smacked you upside the head and been like, fuck Jason, it's not hard. (laughs) Oh yeah. And and when you hear people complain, you know, and even like with the work you do, Jolene, and my time as a crime reporter, you kind of, even it was nothing like being a soldier in the war when people sort of start bitching about their first world problems. And I'm just kind of go, eh, right, you know, get over it. For sure. And I do it. I mean, there are times where I'm just like, ah, why do I have to deal with this? And it's like, suck it up. Yeah. Jolie. This is nothing, <laughs> nothing. Right. Um, yeah. But like, I really think about that and that's going to roll into the episode we talk about where like, just like fitting into this world that we just don't feel like we fit into. I imagine it was very much like that for them. Right. And I mean, obviously huge amounts of depression, anxiety, trauma, um, anger, anger, unexpressed anger, and like inappropriate ways to express anger. Like you can't just shoot people up, but that's kind of what you knew. And that's probably what your outlet was but also like tons of alcoholism. And again, like you look at opioid addiction and different painkiller addictions and things like that as well. Right. Um, and just a huge sense of loneliness. Like, I don't think anybody really has your back in this lifetime, the way that the soldiers had each other's backs, you know? Well, it was a brotherhood. Yeah. It was a brotherhood and now it's a brotherhood slash sisterhood, right? As a strong a bond as family, even hear some of them talk, talk about, you know, And they still do. And it's so painful. So helping them grieve the death of each other is very painful, Um, especially when it's through suicide. And there's a lot of guilt of like, why couldn't they push through this pain the way I did? Um, Very painful to lose their their brothers. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of like survivors remorse a lot. So this, what day is it? It's the, this is out on the 8th. So it's a Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This Friday, we encourage those people, and everyone, to go out to the Cenotaph at Riverside Park here in Kamloops or wherever you celebrate in your town and honor the veterans. Please do so. Yeah, um, they they deserve uh, it. And when when you when you look at those poppies, when you talk to your children about you know what war means and who some of these individuals are in our lives, and we remember them, just connect with it even more. I think it's so easy for us to disconnect and say, oh, this doesn't impact me. This was such an event of the past. I'm continually reminded in my work that it is not. I am supporting people in the today and the now in terms of how all of this has impacted them and continues to, and therefore impact the rest of us because they're interacting with the rest of us in this world. Exactly. So, you know, and if you know someone who's a veteran and they're having a tough time, or maybe they react in a way that you find offensive, pause before you speak and think about why. Yeah, absolutely. 
So thank you. Thank you to all of the veterans out there. Thank you to all of the loved ones who supported them going and fighting for our country. You know, my grandma was one of them, supported her children and family to let my grandpa go and recognizing there are lots of people in the sidelines that um, also are to thank. And again, just incredibly grateful for that. Next week, we'll be back with a whole new episode likely the one about fitting into a world that you may not be- feel like you belong in. Uh, until then, I'm Jason. I'm Jolene. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.